Welcome to the Evergreen Thumb, your go-to podcast for up-to-date research-based horticulture and environmental stewardship knowledge to help you grow and manage your garden. Produced by Washington State University Extension Master Gardener Volunteers and brought to you by the Master Gardener Foundation of Washington State. I'm your host, Aaron Hoover, a WSU Extension Master Gardener since 2015 and a certified permaculture designer and modern homesteader. WSU Master Gardener Volunteers are university-trained community educators who have been cultivating plants, people, and communities since 1973. Are you ready to grow? Let's dig into today's episode. Welcome to the Evergreen Thumb, episode 25. In this episode, we're delving into what I consider a crucial aspect of gardening, and that is evaluating the credibility of gardening resources. With the wealth of information available online and in print, it's essential for gardeners to discern what sources they can trust. We'll explore key criteria and practical tips for identifying credible gardening resources. Before we jump into that, though, it is time to talk about the July gardening calendar. For gardening maintenance, there's a lot of things to do this time of year. If you want to keep your lawn green, which, as we learned in episode 22, that is a good way to protect and your home and create defensible space in case of a wildfire. It's important to frequently and deeply water your lawn during periods of heat and drought stress. Irrigate a quarter inch four to six times per week from June through August, and you should, can measure that water depth by placing an empty tuna can in a location where your irrigation water lands. Uh, As the growing season continues, if you're growing potatoes, it's a good idea to mound up soil around the base of the plants to help keep them covered um, because if they are exposed to sun, they will turn green and they don't make very good eating that way. So, And then another option is to gather and eat new potatoes, which are potatoes that haven't been cured, uh, from each hill um, after flowering. Um, and but if you as they start to grow out of the soil surface, you can pick those off before they get green and enjoy them. Uh, to help reduce evaporation when watering your vegetable and flower gardens, water in the early morning, and then what make sure you're watering the soil rather than the leaves. This helps reduce diseases, particularly uh, fungal diseases. And if you water deeply and infrequently, then it will help encourage root growth. Uh, pay careful attention to the watering and feeding hanging of hanging baskets and of flower or vegetable plantings during extended periods of hot weather. Weed and fertilize rhubarb and asparagus now that they're more or less done for the season. A mulch of compost or composted cow manure works very well as a fertilizer. And then water deeply to develop crowns for next year's harvest. Mulching uh, is a really good way to conserve soil moisture and prevent evaporation. You can mulch with straw, wood chips, particularly arborist chips. Personally, I don't recommend plastic or sawdust. You can mix sawdust in with other products like straw or wood chips, um, but you don't want to use exclusively sawdust because it's fine enough that will prevent air exchange with the soil and it affects the permeability of the soil because water and oxygen cannot get through that. It creates a crusty layer. Uh, Be sure to stake tall growing flowering plants like delphiniums, hollyhocks, lupines. You also want to make sure you stake your tomatoes and any other vining plants. Make sure they have attachment points to the arbors or the stakes that you're growing them on. Make compost of lawn clippings and garden plants that are ready to be recycled. However, do not use lawn clippings if the lawn has been treated with an herbicide, including weed and feed products. Don't compost diseased plants unless you're using a hot compost method where your compost gets in excess of 120 degrees. In planting and propagation, beets, bush beans, carrots, brassicas, lettuce, and peas planted in midsummer provide fall and winter crops. Divide spring bulbs when tops have died down, then divide and store or replant. And along the coast, uh, you can it's time you can do your first plantings of Chinese cabbage, kohlrabi, and rutabagas and similar crops. For pest monitoring and management, control hollyhock rust by picking the effective leaves and 
throwing them in the garbage. Do not throw them in your yard waste bin or in your compost. Or you can spray with a registered fungicide. Be sure to read and follow all label directions before using any chemical control. Monitor for cutworm damage. In July, climbing cutworms can become a problem and large portions of foliage will begin to disappear. Use barriers, remove by hand, use beneficial nematodes, or spray with BTK according to label directions. In late July, begin to monitor for early and late blight on tomatoes. Prune tomatoes for air circulation, picking off affected leaves, and or treating with an approved fungicide. Place traps to catch adult apple maggot flies. You can use pheromone traps to monitor the presence of pests and then treat as necessary. Also, you can spray filbert trees for filbert worm as necessary. Again, it's important to ensure you have an issue before using any sort of chemical control. Cover blueberry bushes with netting to help keep birds from eating all your precious blueberries. Uh, Monitor camellias, hollies, and maple trees for scale insects and treat if necessary. Monitor rhododendrons for adult root weevils. Uh, Look for fresh evidence of feeding, which is usually notching on the leaves. You can use sticky trap products on plant trunks to attract adult weevils. It's been suggested that if you put a piece of burlap or fabric underneath the sticky trap to protect the the bark of the plant trunk uh, and attach it uh, to the trunk. And that way you'll know if you have a root weevil problem. If root weevils are a consistent problem, you may want to consider removing those plants and choosing a more resistant variety. Uh, this time of year, spider mites can become a problem on ornamental plants during dry, hot weather. Watch for dusty-looking foliage, loss of color, and the presence of tiny white, tiny mites. Wash infested areas with water or spray with an appropriate pesticide. East of the Cascades, it may be necessary to spray for corn earworm as silking begins, but be sure to protect bees from spray and, again, follow the label instructions exactly. Continue monitoring soft fruits like raspberry, blackberry, blueberry for spotted wing drosophila. If flies are present, use an integrated and least toxic approach to manage the pests. Check leafy vegetables for caterpillars and remove them as they appear. This is really common on brassicas like broccoli, kale, cabbages. Sometimes they're called cabbage worms. Little green worms. I usually remove them by hand. Sometimes I'll feed them to my chickens. They're uh, fairly easy to control if you check frequently, in my experience. And that covers the July gardening calendar. Okay, so we're moving on to gardening resources. As I mentioned, we're going to talk about how to evaluate resources of gardening information and know which sources you can trust. Now, just as a a quick story, I once used coffee grounds as a mulch around my lettuce and in my lettuce bed because I heard that they were high in nitrogen and made a good mulch. And I know a lot of coffee shops in the area, you know, give away their used coffee grounds. So it was a cheap source of, of nutrients for the garden. Well, because I didn't do my research and didn't get my information from a trusted source, I ended up burning all of my lettuce plants and making them inedible because uncomposted coffee grounds are phototoxic to plants. So that's just like kind of an example of why it's really important to use credible resources or if you hear something that sounds feasible or you know is related to a problem that you have that you do some more research and make sure that that's credible information what i found is that unreliable advice at best can lead to poor plant health and or low yields if you're talking about uh, food crops at worst it can waste your money or even harm the environment Using good information and reliable resources can improve your yields, whether it be food or flowers. It can prevent disease. It can save your money and your time. It helps reduce pollution. It can improve soil health and contribute to your ongoing education and growth as a gardener. So just kind of as an example, if a gardener is struggling to grow healthy tomato plants, despite trying various fertilizers and pest control methods recommended by friends or what they read on Facebook groups. And their tomato plants consistently developed yellow leaves for poor fruit set and pest infestations. 
one option is a gardener can contact their local master gardener through the county extension office, and they can provide you with information on how to do soil testing, proper fertilization, and integrated pest management practices. Now, this is not saying you have to rely exclusively on Master Gardeners, though that's why the Master Gardener program exists. But having reliable resources prevents gardeners from having to use trial and error and spend years finding what works when the science is already there for them to learn from. Next, I'm going to go through some of the character re- characteristics of reliable gardening advice. Uh, it's important to know the expertise or the credentials of the person that you're getting advice from. This could be horticulturalists, botanists, um, entomologists, if it's a disease issue. It's a good idea to know what kind of background this person has and if you're getting it from an individual. And if it's someone that, you know, someone you know personally who has a beautiful garden every year and doesn't seem to have a lot of problems, you know, ask for their advice. And you can always do more research to see if their advice holds up. Another thing is to just because someone is credentialed doesn't make them necessarily an expert. What I mean by this is if someone has a PhD after their name, it might be a good idea to find out what their PhD is in. Uh, I once heard an example of a an exercise instructor who was using their PhD initials after her name, but her PhD was in economics. Uh, economics and exercise. I doubt she got much exercise related education in her PhD uh, economic studies. So that's just kind of, you know, what you want to make sure is that if this person does have credentials, what the area of study is and, or just even the experience, Um, you know, you don't always have to rely on experts, but people who have a lot of experience can be a wealth of information. Uh, But again, it's a good idea to double check some of that information um, just to verify so that you're not wasting your time. Another thing to consider is, is the information research-based? Is there science to back this up? One example is um, a lot of people talk about using vinegar as a weed killer in the garden. And using household vinegar isn't necessarily dangerous, but it's not going to give you the results that you're looking for that an agricultural grade vinegar would. However, agricultural grade vinegar is very strong and I believe it requires a pesticide applicator's license to use. And if you don't follow the on-label instructions, not only could you do serious damage to your garden, but you can do serious damage to your health. And so it's important to to make sure that you are using science-based information. One of the ways that I make sure that I'm using research-based information in my sources is when I am doing a search on a search engine, I will often put in my search topic and add WSU because, or that's the land grant university for my state and land grant universities, their mission has everything to do with gardening and agriculture and, and things like that. So they are going to be doing the most research on gardening related topics. If I can't find the topic I'm looking for at WSU, then I will often go to Oregon State or University of Idaho. Those are the land grant universities in my neighboring states. If I still can't find what I'm looking for, then I will change it to just EDU so that I can look for sources from any university or any educational institution. And I consider those to be reliable sources because they're doing scientific research and use evidence-based practices. Another thing to consider when determining the reliability of of sources or of advice is to look at references and citations. So if you're if you find a website that's giving gardening advice, do they provide references? Do they cite studies or do they cite reliable uh, books or 
magazines, you know, what, what kind of resources are they using to get their information? So that transparency, when they do offer resources, uh, references and citations, adds credibility to the information that they're providing. Another way to evaluate the information that you're looking at is a system, a system created by California State University at Chico, and it's called the CRAAP test. C-R-A-A-P. And that stands for credibility, relevance, authority, accuracy, and purpose. So we'll go through each of those to kind of give you an idea. So credibility, things to look at, whether or not it's credible is when was it published? Is this something where the research changes frequently and you need the most up-to-date information, or does it really even matter for your particular question? Has the information been revised or updated if it was originally published a long time ago and there is new information in that field? Has it been updated? And if you're on a website, which is seems to be most likely these days when we're doing research, is their website fully functional? Is it maintained? That'll give you an idea of how hands-on the author or the company is on their website and whether or not they are maintaining up-to-date information. So then the next criteria is relevance. Does the information relate to your topic or answer your question or is it clickbait? You know, you want to make sure just because it shows up in a search result doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be relevant to your topic. And if the search result sent you to that article and it has nothing to do with your topic, then it's there's a pretty good chance that they're using tactics to get wayward searches onto their website and are not going to have reliable and irrelevant information. Another thing to look at is who is the intended audience for the information? Um, You know, is it and is it an appropriate information for your level of expertise? So are they talking to other scientists and you're a brand new beginning gardener? That is not going to be relevant to you, probably because it's going to be too too much information or too technical for someone who's just learning how to garden. You know, so keep in mind who their intended audience. If they're using a lot of jargon and a lot of technical, a lot of technical vocabulary, try looking for another store, source that is more at your level of expertise. Have you looked at a variety of resources? Uh, this is what goes back to what I was saying earlier. You know, if you get someone gives you an idea on a way to manage blight on your tomatoes, do a search for that information as well and see if you can get corroboration from a, a relevant and reliable source. And another criteria that may or may not be applicable depending on who you are and how you feel about it, but if you were writing a research paper on this subject, would you be comfortable citing this source? For me, that's a prob- pretty strong indicator of how I feel how relevant a source is or how reliable a source is. I have written a lot of papers and I have researched a lot of talks and workshops for Master Gardeners and podcast episodes. And it is very important to me that my resources and my citations are reliable and relevant. So that is a criteria that is is important to me, has meaning to me. The next set of criteria in the CRAAP test is authority. So who is the author or the publisher or the source or the sponsor? Um, I would recommend being careful with sponsored articles and posts as the writer is getting paid to say what they're saying, especially if it's about a specific product. So that's always something to keep in mind. Follow the money. If it's a sponsored article, a sponsored post, Remember that they are getting paid. They oftentimes they will say it's unbiased, but in my opinion, even if they're trying to be unbiased, there's probably still going to be a little bit of bias there. What are the author's credentials or or organizational affiliations? If they have a a PhD in entomology, then they're going to probably know what they're talking about when it comes to pests in your garden. Another type of authority is relevant organizations that can be a great source of information. Of course, Master Gardeners is my favorite, but there are other, there are horticultural societies, there's a native plant society, uh, Xerces Society is great for uh, pollinators, your local conservation district, horticulture, agriculture, 
and entomology departments at colleges and universities, the, your state department of agriculture, the United States Department of Agriculture's Natural Resources Conservation Service is a great uh, source for information about soils and agriculture. That's just a short list of some of the organizations that can be great sources of reliable information. Another criteria is the author qualified to write on the topic. This goes back to what I said earlier. If they have letters after their name, what do they mean? And you know, if they do have a PhD, what field is it actually in? Is it at all related to the topic they're writing on? Or are they being deceptive about using their credentials for an unrelated topic or field? That doesn't mean they're not qualified to talk, speak on the topic. So another way, thing to look at in the sources is their contact information, such as a publisher or an email address where you can contact them to get more information or ask them more questions. Does the URL of the website that you're on reveal anything about the source? Is it a .gov or a .edu? Again, that's where it goes back to as I branch out in my search to get the reliable answers I'm looking for, I will add .edu or .edu to my gardening-related searches so that I know that I'm getting research-based information from an educational institution. And as I said, if you start with your local land-grant university, then you're most likely to get relevant research-based information because per the United States Code, a land-grant university's mission is to teach practical agriculture and science. So like I said, start with your local land-grant university or your even your local county extension office and because they have a wealth of information on their individual county websites, and that's going to be more localized to you. Um, and then work your way out if you're not finding enough information. All right. So the next step in the acronym is the second A is accuracy. Where does the information come from? Is the information supported by evidence? Has the information been reviewed? So whether it's been peer reviewed or can you verify any of the information from another source? Like I said, you know, if someone tells you something, can you verify it with another source? Like how to treat blight on your tomatoes or how to prune your apple tree? You know, it's being able to find multiple sources that corroborate what you've been told or what you're learning reinforces that knowledge and its reliability and its accuracy. Another thing to consider for accuracy is does the language or tone of the information seem unbiased and free of emotion? Research-based no uh, information is usually will be unbiased or as unbiased as possible and free of emotion. I honestly I don't think anything is completely unbiased, but it's important for it to be as neutral as possible. And misinformation often has a tone that is very emotional and very fear-based. Again, like I was going back to the clickbait, you know, if it's misinformation or if it's not reliable or accurate information, it's going to stir, they want to stir up emotions in you that make you feel fear and want you to believe it. Um, and this isn't necessarily all uh, gardening information, but it is still something important to keep in mind. Another thing to consider is, are there spelling or grammar or typographical errors uh, in the article or in the blog post or the book or whatever? No source is going to be completely free of typos or spelling errors. They happen. They get by some of the best editors out there. But if it's obvious that the author is not making an effort to write without these errors, then that's a red flag. And finally, the last criteria is purpose. What is the purpose of this information? Is it to inform and teach? Is it to sell? Is it to entertain or is it to persuade? And do the authors or sponsors make their intentions or purpose clear? Is the information fact? Is it opinion or is it propaganda? Facts, like I said, the, along like the language, they should be objective and free of emotion. Opinions are often biased and attempt to be persuasive. But if they're truly expressing an opinion, then they will acknowledge other viewpoints and use a respectful tone. Whereas propaganda is often manipulative and emotionally charged and relies on exaggeration or uses unreliable sources. So that pretty much covers the crap test. So just to kind of review, you know, whether you're looking at printed materials or online resources or local resources, 
lack of author information or making sensational claims are red flags, overemphasis on miracle solutions and or unsupported and anecdotal claims or outdated information. These are all common red flags to be aware of when you're evaluating resources. In printed materials, you can look for reputable publishers and look at how recently the books have been published. So there are certain publishers out there. The only one that comes to mind off the top of my head is Chelsea Green. They tend to publish books that have much more niche in organic and regenerative agriculture and gardening. Um, But there are newsletters, magazines that come out that are produced by like those same organizations I mentioned earlier by, you know, the Xerces Society or the Native Plant Society, they might have newsletters that you can join. WSU has a number of of email lists that you can join and get regular articles from them. But, and even more importantly, using local resources, because those are going to be the most reliable to where you are, whether it's uh, extension Uh, botanical gardens, like I said, native plant societies, horticulture clubs. These are all going to be give you the most localized and most reliable information. I hope that kind of gives you a better idea how to evaluate the reliability of resources. I know it's really convenient to go to your favorite blogger or your or a Facebook group and ask and you're going to get if you ask a question in a Facebook group, you're probably going to get 50 different answers. And they're not all wrong, but you need to be discerning and do follow up research on which of those methods is going to be the most reliable. Thanks for listening today. I want to invite you to share your stories with me. Um, If you've ever come across unreliable or questionable gardening advice and how you were able to work through it or work around it and find another option. If you have any other questions on reliable resources or the crap test, email me at hello at theevergreenthumb.com. Thanks for listening. Thank you for joining us on this episode of The Evergreen Thumb brought to you by the WSU Extension Master Gardener Program volunteers and sponsored by the Master Gardener Foundation of Washington State. We hope that today's discussion has inspired and equipped you with valuable insights to nurture your garden. The Master Gardener Foundation of Washington State is a nonprofit organization whose primary purpose is to provide unifying support and advocacy for WSU Extension Master Gardener programs throughout Washington State. To support the Master Gardener Foundation of Washington State, visit www.mastergardenerfoundation.org forward slash donate. Whether you're an experienced Master Gardener or just starting out, the WSU Extension Master Gardener Program is here to support you every step of the way. WSU Extension Master Gardeners empower and sustain diverse communities with relevant, unbiased, research-based horticulture education. Reach out to your local WSU Extension office to connect with master gardeners and tap into a wealth of resources that can help you achieve gardening success. To learn more about the program or how to become a master gardener, visit mastergardener.wsu.edu forward slash get hyphen involved. If you enjoyed today's episode and want to stay connected with us, be sure to subscribe to future episodes filled with expert tips, fascinating stories, and practical advice. Don't forget to leave a review and share it with fellow gardeners to spread the joy of gardening. Questions or comments to be addressed in future episodes can be sent to hello at theevergreenthumb.org. The views, thoughts, and opinions expressed by guests of this podcast are their own and do not imply endorsement by Washington State University or the Master Gardener Foundation of Washington State. Mm-hmm.